Uh, welcome to Parallax. Um, Parallax is a platform for fearless and heterodox thinking. Um, we're doing a lot of cool stuff uh, these days. We have a new lecture series, a new podcast, a new YouTube channel. Subscribe. We have tons of interviews and great articles, like a recent one by Lena Anderson about the Bildung movement. We're trying to develop our, into a learning community, a movement, a revolution of sorts. If you'd like to help out, subscribe on YouTube, sign up for our pod, new podcast, new Parallax podcast. Check out our website, become a member of Patreon, help us out. Today we have our first ever Sweeney versus Bard live podcast um, uh, we, and four Zoom, because usually we have three, uh, now we have four. Um, our guests are, as always, the incredible Alexander Bard, the amazing and talented Cadell Last, and the socialite and philosopher Raven Connolly, who is incidentally the first ever woman on the Sweeney versus Bard, Bard podcast. Um, and we have a rather provocative title which Alexander cooked up, Sexual Apocalypse, Stealing Queer Back from the Woke. So we invited Cadell and Raven on after a very lively exchange they had on our previous lecture and it felt like the conversation needed to be continued. So what we're gonna to do today is we're gonna dialogue for a good hour and a half and then open this up for Q&A. And when you come on Q&A, turn on your camera so we can see you. And also, as you're listening, write your questions in the chat. You can ask those questions later or we can read them for you if uh, you don't want to appear on YouTube. Okay, so the first question I have for you guys. Um, uh, so, Alexander, what do you mean by sexual apocalypse? And what do you mean by queer? What is queer? And why do we have to steal queer back from woke? Okay, let me first say that I love this foursome. <laughs> I've been looking forward to this so much. I've been jerking off thinking about this for days. So there you go. At least mentally jerking off. So there you go. I've um, been mentally jerking off too, by the way. Yes, mentally jerking off. Definitely. We're mind fucking a lot here at Parallax, aren't we? Uh, um, anyway, um, I think it's a brilliant podcast title or webcast title, if you like. I just love it. All right. So what do we mean? Um, what we mean is that there are some really great social movements from the 20th century that we're quite proud of. And, and I think it's time to start revisiting them. And I think they should also be able to handle a good critique by now. And in this sense, uh, I'm very proud to be with you three guys because... It's like having Slavoj Šišek and Kamil Pagla and Chogyam Trungpa in the same room. <laughs> uh, yeah, you, you're obviously their children and you're not them, but since they're probably so demented and old by now that it's just like having Joseph Biden in the White House. You don't know which day he's going to wake up and actually look like a human rather than a corpse. <laughs> you know, Pagla, Šišek and Trungpa are all old or gone or whatever by now, so you more or less replace them. But the fact that you can speak their voices the fact that Cadill can be Slavoj, the fact that Raven can be Camille, and the fact that actually is honestly Andrew many times is, is, is Cholyam, is I think a great starting point for me since I'm only pretending to be a modest little Persian philosopher from 3,700 years ago called Zoroaster. So there we go. Uh, that was the presentation. Um, what I mean with stealing, stealing, well, stealing fires, like stealing fire, Prometheus here, but stealing queer back from woke is that I actually, I was, a, I was a queer theorist already in the 1980s. And I think queer is a fantastic name for anything that is a deviation from a norm. And what I mean with that, historically speaking, is that we have a matriarchy and we have a patriarchy. And I love those two words, but I always use them in the same sentence, not to be misunderstood these days. But the matriarchy or the inner circuit, which is dominated by the matriarchy in the original tribe and and women, women in general, and then the outer circuit dominated by the elders and the patriarchs. Uh, that's where the war and the hunting is going on and that, that shit, you know, the protection, the provision of the inner circuit goes on to the outer circuit. And that's where we mostly find, you know, most straight men. Then we have the occasional lesbian with the bazooka who walks into the hunting and the warfare does better than the guys do. And then the occasional gay hairdresser who walks into the room of all the women and dress better than they do. So he becomes a fashion designer. So we have these androgynous people who walk in between these two realms and they're called androgynous. And and, and this is one of the things we're gonna talk about tonight is the LGBT movement and whatever happened to it, because this is about taking pride in the androgynous and understanding the enormous contribution of value they add to society. 
And of course, feminism is part of this. It is the inner circuit, which was in the River Valleys three, 4,000 years ago, hidden and closed up or whatever. And we've finally seen the unleashing of the enormous power and creativity coming out of the inner circuit, which is called the feminism, at least classical feminism. And then we also have the shamanoid characters. And the shamanoid characters are the guys who walk in the borderline between tribes. So they're related to the androgynous, but not the same. In the data anthropology that John Sedequist and I work with, we have more or less proven by now that about 4% of any general population are androgynous. They're LGBT, not queer, LGBT. And the shamanoids, another 4% of the population are, are, you know, are in between tribes. So that's the reason why we're not constant warfare with, with foreigners and strangers all the time. We have people who actually do walk back and forth in between and give us ayahuasca to cool us down now and then, right? So, that's shamanoids. Uh, as for the rest of the 92% of the population, um, they are usually straight men and straight women. So just, Alexander, why not queer? Shows out of that. So the point is this, is that queer to me summarizes both the shamanoid and the androgynous characters and giving them value and giving them their proper role in society. And I think what happened with queer theory is that went completely amok for two reasons. One of them was that the shamanoid characters became the idols for everybody that everybody should attempt to be. And I think Shabu Shishik here is an interesting case of a compulsive, repetitive failure of being queer. He's been married six times by now. He's marrying his mommy all the time. He, he's, he's like the most miserable, white, heterosexual man you could ever think of, which makes him an interesting Slovenian shamanoid in a weird sort of twisted sense, right? But that's what he is. Okay, whereas Camille Pagla is like a warrior, like who understands this, has defended the androgynous and defended the shamanoids at all time. And if the queer theories had only listened to Camille and stayed with classical feminism, stayed with the LGBT movement, we would have stayed in a much better place today than we are because we didn't listen to Paglia. And I think going back to revisit Paglia and maybe also using Shishik as kind of a reflection of where the straight gods are at in relationship to this could be very fruitful tonight. But what I would like to do is to steal queer back from woke where the word should never belong. And I want to provoke by saying this first. The terminology LGBTQ is ridiculous. It is okay. incredibly destructive because so, e either you have a queer movement where you fight for shamanoids or endogenous people. Okay, just one more clarification or, here. Like, or, or you fight for the LGBT, yeah. which is the endogenous population. Yeah. So the way I see it, the problem is, is that there isn't a third gender, right? And there should be. Uh, and the third sure, sure gender should be all the other genders that aren't male and female. Uh, and instead, we have an infinite number of categories that we're trying to create, which just create confusion and, and fragmentation within the, the sham. The no, 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 no. The, the Indians do that. They have three genders in India, so that can be done. Yes, but I think yeah. that's cheap shooting. That's just, that's just, that's just trying to find a, a shortcut out of a, an actually much more interesting problem, much more productive problem here. I think we need an overall tribal map and we don't need more identifications. I would rather say this. When the LGBT whatever movement went so damn psychotic a few years ago that it accepted asexuals, as a sexual category. That's what he gets really interested in a Hegelian way. Mm. I was like, oh my God, the church ladies have their own sexual minority now. <laughs> no, 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 if you are asexual per definition, you are asexual. You're not a sexual minority. And, and, but I think it's a good end point because you can't really add any more letters to these pathological psychotic distinctions of minorities or minorities and minorities any longer. I think this is a good time to return to classical feminism a la Camille Pagla and I think it's a good time to return to the classical LGBT project which I think Milo Yiannopoulos or somebody like that represents, represents much better than LGBTQ activists do these days. Mm -hmm. Raven, do you want to pipe in? And do you, what does that bring up for you? Um... Sure. Ah, so much. I mean, I, I really, all of that really excites me, what you're saying, Alexander. I, I think what's, what's interesting for me here is it seems like there's like different kind of layers, right? Like there's, there's the, the body, there's like the body that you have and there seems to be this like you're, you're male, you're female, and there's like a very small sliver of people who happen to be intersex. And this kind of gets into this idea of like um, how other people perceive you as being related to your gender role within the tribe. 
I wanted to bring this up with you. Like, how is it the gender role is even conceived within the tribe? Is it so much of like what you feel within yourself or is it how you relate to the other um, people around you and the necessity of you to fill whatever role your body kind of affords you within the group? And then when we've kind of decoupled, um, you know, the body from all of its previous roles, what, what does that kind of unleash? There's a kind of, um, I don't know, like an unleashing of all of this potential. Um, and these like clusters of behaviors have just kind of opened and crossed. And maybe that in and of itself is kind of like where we find ourselves with the androgynous being explored so much. I don't know, I'm just kind of riffing. Um, but do you have anything to say I think, about I think different layers? Okay, uh, if I respond to that, I think what helps is to understand that we were nomadic. We were constantly on the move. Uh, if we were constantly on the move, the first division that's really important is who's going to lead. And that's like the speech that the priest gives in the morning. It's about leadership. And among men, the first division is among men. Women don't get this thing with division that men are so damn obsessed with. And there's a good reason for that. Because it's men who are obsessed with division because without division, men cannot lead. That's why men is the gender that divides body and mind. But the tragedy of history is that eventually as we specialized, we've had people who specialize in the body so much that they want to disregard the mind completely. And we have people who specialize in the mind so much that they disregard the body completely. And this is exactly, for example, women get locked up and, and there's a need for feminism eventually resurging. Because the cultures I prefer to study, like Peru and Iran and Southern India, women and men have been equal all along. In Zoroastrianism, they've been equal for 4,000 years. Okay, so when you do the nomadic move, you understand that first of all, you've got to separate the priest and the chieftains. You've got to separate the expert of mind from the expert of the body. And the only way for the tribe to successfully move forward is for these two guys to affirm each other and admire each other and collaborate. And all structures eventually, as we got, I studying the Jewish nation, for example, in my work, and I'm studying the Zoroastrian Persian Empire that lasted 400 years, because we desperately need to find better models than communist China for larger populations than just the tribe. We have to redefine nationalism of these things today philosophically. And what I'm working with here is the division between the priest and the chief and how they admire each other and understand each other's expertise, and also how they never interfere with each other's territories. For example, in the Mithraic order in the Roman army, the priest would be higher than the chieftain. He would be seventh highest grade and the sixth highest grade would be the king. But the priest would often even castrate himself and cut off his penis so he could not reproduce. Thereby, he was allowed to be one of the gods among men so that the king could be the highest of the men. And therefore, it was the son of the king who inherited. And the second son of the king was often appointed as the next priest. So the wonderful mechanisms that have worked throughout history in, in long-term lasting working systems of patriarchy are the ones that I'm studying at the moment to understand where we go first. That's the first division. The second division is again among men, the second division between the warrior and the hunter. And that comes during the day and the afternoon, and that's among regular men. They have to differentiate between warrior and hunter. Today, I would say that's, for example, engineers versus traders, not farmers, because women were more farmers than men ever were. So, so the traders and engineers are typically masculine traits. Then after that, and only after that, in the evenings, you know, when it gets hot and sleazy and, and the sexual ritual takes place, that's a women walk into the room and the divisions that the men have made during the day, the men can finally understand is the division between man and woman because woman is just woman mm -hmm. and man is like woman with a mistake, <laughs> with an exception, mm -hmm. with a penis between his legs that is both terrified of, finds it hard to handle, and can't live without, right? So mm. the penis is in this sense, exceptionally, it's that it's an extimate object, Jacques Lacan says. I'm sure cattle can fill in here later and talk more about Lacan's understanding of, of the penis. But when it comes to actually our imagination of body, mm -hmm. there are actually two female genital organs that we play with. The matrix that we come from originally, the mamilla that supports us during childhood, and then finally we're supposed to go towards the phallus, and then finally, we're supposed to make a rebellion against the phallus and become grown-up human beings, men and women. But th th I think that it's more important to understand this bigger pattern first before, before we even start talking about gender roles. Because honestly, for all the creativity I see in gender roles today, I just see a lot of confused kids 
who are playing around with makeup and, and you know, eyeshadow and taking away fat or doing Botox to go to the gym in a desperate attempt just for plain attention. That there's so much, so much of this narcissism today on the internet, which is just still playing to the, will mother please see me so I can get the unconditional love? Because they're even terrified of thinking of the father figure as somebody who gives you love that is conditional and based on reality. We're not even there. We have, we have so much of this infantilization or side deal with first. And I think it's better than to play around with the nomadology because in the nomadology, we have only archetypes. We do not have genders. We have archetypes that are purposes. The first ones that are guaranteed are the female ones because they're all involved with reproduction. That's half the job. Women do not have to look for purpose. They're either directly or indirectly involved in the reproduction of the tribe itself. Men are nothing without women. Because of our women, there's no heritage. There's no life beyond your own death without woman and child. So that's guaranteed. What we're dealing with mostly in our society today, which I don't think feminists even understand, is that we've torn apart patriarchy and we haven't replaced it with other models that are more genuine and deeper that men can actually orientate themselves accordingly to. It seems like sense? the problem with feminism might be that it's trying to make this 4% of the population like that you talk about everybody, and that, that will never happen I mean, I th no, I don't think feminism is to blame. I think no, not uh, feminism. Uh, so, sorry, no, uh, it the is woke, popular the woke culture. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I don't want to put down feminism. Okay. Correctly. We had terrible phalluses called Hitler mm -hmm. and Stalin in 1945, who'd caused havoc on the world and killed 100 million, mostly young men. Okay, for very understandable reasons, the reaction after 1945 was that anything that wasn't phallus was a good thing. The problem is we then resorted to tons of mediocrity because it did not compare things according to the phallic case, which is relentless and ruthless. We started looking at the world like a daycare center where everybody was unconditional love no matter what they did. That means we were totally unprepared for the internet revolution when everybody got a megaphone and everybody had a voice and everybody could speak and express themselves. And now we arrived at a stage where 99% of the people who tried to give themselves a voice, have now been ruthlessly thrown up against the wall of arrogance and ignorance, which is like, nobody cares what you do. Nobody cares because you're talentless. You, you haven't been guided, you haven't been educated. You don't even know what you're doing. And I think that's the stage we're at during the early 2020s. Adele, I, I wanna bring in um, Zizek a little bit um, uh, because somehow this, this, this narrative that Alexander is, is expressing, uh, I don't get any of that from Zizek somehow. Zizek's whole purpose seems to be about emancipation of some kind, right? It seems to be revolutionary. Uh, whereas Alexander's talking about archetypes and, and, and that, that sort of thing. So, so anyway, I'm interested in you bringing in uh, the spirit of Zizek into this conversation and what would he say and what would you say to Alexander's um, narrative here? Well, in the, in the spirit of the title of Stealing Queer Back from the Woke, I, I, I would introduce sort of um, a metaphysics which is in, in, I would say, in the lineage of, of Zizek's philosophy, which is, as, as, far, as, I'm, as far as I'm concerned, it's, it's this metaphysics of multiplicity versus the metaphysics of the absent one, or maybe Bard would call that the Bard absolute. So... As it regards the metaphysics of multiplicity, there is this desire to, um, as it were, unleash pure multiplicity. Um, and this is a reaction formation against a tyrannical one. So LGBT plus is an example of that multiplicity in its actuality and the problem with that multiplicity in its actuality is that it doesn't understand that the original state is not pure multiplicity and that in order for multiplicity to exist, it requires an external obstacle, which I know you guys have talked about before. So multiplicity can only sustain itself with an external obstacle, which is kind of a figment. Uh, I think maybe it's been called in some of your conversations the abject um 
Uh, of course, the stereotype of the abject in this, the, in this contemporary version of multiplicity is the, the white heterosexual male. It's, it's, it's almost too silly to engage with, and it's almost too silly to engage with until you're forced to engage with it as a result of being labeled as such, and then, you're, then you have to think about it, and you have to be brought into the field and, and, and participate with this insanity, basically. And, and, and so basically what I would propose as the opposite of this, and to be honest, if you go back to the, the intersectional postmodern philosophical foundations, I'm, it, it is Deleuze. I mean, in A Thousand Plateaus, he, Deleuze says explicitly that he's trying to formulate a metaphysics of multiplicity, which has no relationship to the one. And, and the postmodern people think this is a new idea or an original idea, and it's not. It's, it's a very old idea and it's, and it's, and it's a bad idea and, and previous, previous human beings have, have already figured that out and that's why it, that's why it wasn't used. But nonetheless, it's, it's understandable that this desire for pure multiplicity was reacting against a tyrannical one. Um, I think in the end, um, we have to make this distinction between the spurious, the spurious infinity of the multiplicity versus trying to think true infinity. And true infinity is sort of coming to terms with the sexual difference at the core of every individual. And that gender is kind of the way in which a subject deals um, with true infinity or the sexual real. Um, and maybe, maybe, uh, the way Bart is trying to conceptualize this with archetypes, um, with the sort of percentage of the population being, you know, 90% are naturally on the masculine and feminine side, and then you have the more androgynous characters, the shamanoid characters. That could be an interesting way to approach it, um, um, because there's a lot of paradoxes here. Um, and we have to allow for the possibility that although the ancient world might be a place to get these archetypes, we also have to allow for the possibility that the 21st century is so radically other and so radically different that there could be different forms that have no historical reference point. And I don't know, that may be an interesting place to have the conversation, but that's what I would say as a starting point. Can I, can I play to that? Yeah, uh, okay, let's look at what Shishik and Deleuze have in common. They're both terrified of dick. <laughs> both of them. I mean, Shishik is the feminine hysteric these days. <laughs> he admits it. And Deleuze was like a romantic hippie when he was bad. He was very good, but when he was bad, he was just a romantic hippie. So I agree with everything Cattle just said. But I'd like to point out that in response to the idea that you must have an abject for the multiplicity to make sense, no, the abject could also be a project. Objectification in Lacan analysis is the mamilla. It's the longing back to the objet PTR that we try to find absolutely everywhere, but it doesn't have to be that way. Now, if you sort of read Hegel through Deleuze or read Deleuze through Hegel, and if you look back in history, you will discover, this is why I'm doing exodologies. Now I'm doing exodus. I'm, do, I'm doing the potential for a chosen few to leave a certain society and move somewhere else and establish the kingdom, right? The way to do that is to look at the grand projects. I, I would like to propose a grand projet A is the response to the objet petit A. The objet petit is the mamilla that we've left and we're longing back to, especially boys do. They want to go back to the mamilla and fight over it. And some of them even want to be enlightened. They want to be enlightened. They're not even pleased with the mamilla. They will go the way back to, to the matrix and extinguish themselves into a moksha or a nirvana, right? But the other way to look at history is that we're actually forced to move forward. We can't avoid that. We have to move towards the phallus and then we have to actually slay the phallus the way you slay the dragon to become fully grown up human beings and become phallic in, in our own personalities. I think Raven would agree with me. This is, of course, virtual. But phallic here means to either have the phallus or to be the phallus. Women are phallus, men have phallus. And that means being fully grown up and, and independent and free from okay, childhood. Qu quick interjection and, and, here. Yeah, so, so I just want to point out. That, that, very, so very product your response topic. And so the problem here is that if you look at it that way, the true infinity that Hegel talks about is actually to me more interesting to work with by going back into history, what we call the root of the phallus 
actually, to look at the original division. And by looking at finding out what original division really is, because it's just a mythical thing. Division is the mythical thing. And the mythical thing here is the division between the chief ten and the priest. And if you look back at that and then go and look at gender roles, it makes a lot more sense. I just have a comment from Thomas Helmerich, our favorite, um, uh, inter uh, uh, let's say, what's the word for Thomas? Our, our hammer here. Uh, Thomas says, it's the other way around. The abject removes difference, undifferentiated by hatred. How would you respond to that? No, it does both because when the abject works, it removes difference and creates a temporary unity. That's exactly what the lynch mob is looking for, an abject, they kill the abject, and then they're released. Larry Girard, right? But, yeah. so yes, that's exactly why intersectionality worked for 30 years because they found the white intersexual man and they attacked him ferociously. And then finally, he came back to haunt them because he turned out to be the working class guy and he voted vote Trump into the White House 2016. And now Trump sort of ignored him and that's why he pissed off at Trump and voted for a corona corpse instead. But so the guy came back to haunt them and the abject is still there and they keep on attacking that abject. So the woke theater is very much in play. It will be around for years to come because of, as long as woke culture finds white heterosexual Western man as something they attack to unify themselves, Thomas absolutely right that creates a temporary unity. Temporary unity, yeah. But my point is that the only way to get out of that is to attack all of them, attack the lynch mob. And the way to attack the lynch mob is to go messianic. That is to stand up against the lynch mob, not by moralizing against the said, oh, you're just a pagan lynch mob, blah, 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 blah. Then they will just kill you for all the good reasons in the world. They should. No, you deserve to be an abject in that case. No, it is to stand up to the abject and become what we call a hyperject. That means you are messianic. You basically said, listen, guys, I've got a plan. I'm going to take my people there, and we're going to create a totally different world there that is superior to the current one. And here's how we're going to do it. Here's the vision of the strategy. Here's the Moses and the Aaron. There's Miriam, who we're both responsible to. The older sister will beat the shit out of us if we fail. And the three of us are going to walk off and do our exodus. And we're going to walk out of this paradigm, out of this territory, and walk into a new world. That is the proper response to the current malaise with objectifications and woke. And we're not going to get out of the woke. I think woke is a big shit test on our culture and the fact that our culture fails because our fa culture has no future. I have a thought. What about uh, the, the connection between uh, queer, because we're go going back to queer, uh, and this mess messiah? messiah. Um, it seems to me that a lot of the people who are standing standing up are are these radical figures that are that are a bit queer in the sense you mean, which is the shamanic caste and, and all, or, or 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 you know gay men or or people who have a kind of a radical sexuality or or they're just they just seem more fearless than the average you know. They're the only ones who get it. They're the only uh, ones who heterosexual G Joe or whatever. In Europe, North America, same thing in East Asia. The queer yeah. people are the only ones standing up, and they're now turning against. The queer movement. Why? Okay, I'll tell you why. We had a Holocaust in the 1940s in Europe for four years. The pink Holocaust was even worse than the Jewish and the Roma Holocaust. The pink Holocaust was repeated, returned as farce, called AIDS. Between 1984 and 1992, millions of gay men died, and their only friends they could find in the world were lesbian women. Okay? But there's a problem to that. It is a material fact. So always talk to the cynical faggot. <laughs> Say, always talk to Mali on Apollo so you get the perfect trickster any culture you walk into. And the cynical faggot today will tell you, well, you know what was the problem with the gay movement? The problem was that all the good looking guys were standing on the dance floor and they were cruising each other and fucking each other to death because AIDS killed all the beautiful men. And the problem is the guys who weren't good looking enough to stand on the dance floor and didn't have the money or the big dick to compensate for it, basically the losers became the political activists. So what's left after 1992, if we're honest about it, radically honest about it, was that the gay movement became very vulnerable because all the beautiful, proud gay guys who invented pride were gone and suddenly a victimhood cult took root. And it happened at exactly the same time that feminism lost its focus and stopped being about proud feminine, strong women, like Camille Pagla and my mother, and started being about women who were victims 
and always victims, and in all circumstances victims, and who needed stand hand out, you know, the, the big state rather than the fallows to, to pay for everything, to pay compensation, everything for everything they've ever gone through, and everything they would go through in the, in the future too. So okay, I want, I want to hear Raven so, talk about feminism. Yeah. So, so, well. yeah, exactly. After you're done. Great, now. yeah. Mm -hmm. I just got to finish it up. Yeah. So uh, my, I, I'm advocating strongly a return to LGBT classics today because lesbian women and gay men are murdered in Uganda and Iran and around the world all the time. And the, pro the thing with the LGBT movement was that it was universal. It was global. It was about LGBT rights around the world. But when the LGBT movement stopped about being about global LGBT rights and became an obsession with asexual church ladies and their makeup in pride parades in New York, and they couldn't care fuck about Uganda and Iran, they completely lost their kernel and their last on d'etre. And that's exactly where it ended up. Mm -hmm. And I think that problem starts after 1992. So Raven, where, where are we at with, with feminism and all this? What's what's going on with feminism? How how do you relate to to feminism um, uh, at the moment? And and you know, I, there's the woke feminism, and then I think sure. there's the brave early feminism. And and uh... I mean, yeah, I I guess from just for me personally, I've mostly like just kind of rejected the term and rejected the just the contemporary movement. Um, I never read feminist theory. I didn't do gender studies in school. I studied evolutionary biology instead. Um, I was interested in getting into the core. And I think that's the part of why, like, you know, Cadell and I have been kind of excited about meeting each other, because, like, thinking about sex. What the fuck is sex? Right? And, like, going into kind of, like, the biological reality of that and seeing what arises kind of out of this asymmetry between uh, the egg and the sperm and in our deep evolutionary history. So I think I've been kind of saved by my interest in deep time um, and some sort of kind of lucidity that I had to, to see things um, where other people were kind of only living on this uh, kind of like social construction level of, of reality. Um, but I think mostly just because it was in my milieu, this like kind of feminist, queer, thing. Um, I had to put up a lot of kind of, you know, walls. And feminism as a term, I feel like has just been dragged through and associated with so much just like crap, that I don't even find it to be, you know, an exciting kind of word to even organize around, you know, um, if I was thinking about buildings, building a women's movement, I don't even know that I would uh, engage with that term. I mean, it could be revived. Just so like you would rather be the philosopher queen, I think, right? <laughs> well, yeah. I, really, I really love the use of the word matriarch. Mm -hmm. okay? I really think that that brings forth to me is these kind of queenly archetypes, women who are taking on responsibility for uh, all of the women I, that are within their, within their group, you know, it's, I feel like there's, uh, you know, there's been this project to dismantle the patriarchy, and I think that actually feminism has done a much better job of dismantling the matriarchy, um, you know, mm -hmm. that relationships between older women and younger women have been kind of burned, they're now in competition with one another, um, they're like, Women are not uh, kind of following their their biological kind of callings, and of course, you know, no woman is obligated, you know, per se, especially in this day and age, to have a child. But a lot of women want to, but are suppressing this kind of uh, biological necessity, and that causes a lot of psychological distress. And these older women become very like bitter and angry if that's something that they wanted, but they didn't end up getting. A woman who doesn't who wants a child. Uh, but doesn't have one is a is a very you know unhappy woman and so all of this you know it really it, it really tears apart what had been I think you know in history and you know obviously talks about this in her family with these like Italian women being so connected to one another and really uh, dominating the household and like <laughs> keeping the men out and like you know all of that like where is that yeah. I I don't know where that is where I see it seems so like there's a lot of fragility, like feminine fragility, oh, yeah. being a, being a, a kind of model for women. Whereas whereas tough women, you know, strong women, women who are you know, even I was reading this 
indigenous artist guy, and he's talking about how the women in his his town got into street fights and uh, you know things like that. So so I don't know. I, I yeah I agree. I think we need to well widen this archetype and and have a strong matriarchal uh, presence in the society, and that seems to be what's missing. I'm sorry to interrupt them. Oh totally. Well, I yeah. think something that you know that Camille talks about too is like really criticizing like wasp culture. And I think a lot of that is the problem. There's like a bunch of young like white women who are kind of uh, like, we're maybe spoiled or coddled or whatever. And uh, they're not out there in the world kind of taking on responsibility. And that includes not wanting to have children, right? Like, because having a child is this like totally transformative experience where you are no longer like the infant to be taken care of you have something of deep responsibility that you're required to take care of. And that type of change, I mean, that's a deep sense, of, that's a deep kind of responsibility that I don't even know if a lot of women um, in my generation, particularly those who were kind of coddled or kept out of reality in some, in some kind of serious way, even have the capacity to do. But if you look at other women in society, like I've been, you know, kind of looking at women on the right wing, these women are like, Puff, man, they're like so they're loud mouths. They're like vigorous, you know. They're like so impassioned. They're aggressive, you know. And and then you have women from like different minority communities. Like there's there's all sorts of really strong women out there. And it seems like the problem is really in this like kind of overeducated kind of like class of women who just want to be like you know these kind of fragile angels. And uh, we shouldn't model ourselves after that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Anybody who does that is, it becomes abject, right? Like they become other. Um, and so women don't know where to go. They're like, who do I mimic? You know, these look like the women I should mimic. Uh, they're writing all the think pieces about feminism. So I, I should be doing that kind of thing. But Great, wonderful. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm intrigued also uh, to ask uh, Cadell, uh, you know, uh, well, let, you, let me let me respond to what's been said a little a little bit, unless you have a really. Oh, just oh yeah, I'll let you speak in a sec. I just want to you know I would like to know uh, how how your your conversation with each other has progressed since since we last since our last lecture. That's that was basically my question. So go ahead and respond to, to Raven, and and if you have any thoughts about that, or or if you want to share any of that, there will be. Well, I get, I guess I guess this is my chance for the continuation of the conversation with Raven. <laughs> so let's see how it let's see it how it, how it unfolds. I just want to say that there are there. I mean, the more I the more I mean I learn about Raven. There's so many parallels with our our intellectual history because I I, I remember actually I was in college and I was in a a women's studies and a gender studies course. And I remember being extremely frustrated by the course precisely because I, in my own mind, I, I was thinking for the first time about the difference between egg and sperm and how that difference between egg and sperm might be an uh, interesting model or form foundation for thinking about sexual difference. And I remember being so frustrated by my speech being silenced throughout the entire course that at the end of the course, after I'd written my exam, I actually got up and I, I just started to uh, basically yell at the professor, say, <laughs> say, saying, saying this, this course is ridiculous, uh, it's pure ideology and so forth. And this is before all the woke stuff. This was like, I don't know, like 12 or 13 or 14 years ago. And then I went into evolutionary anthropology and evolutionary biology. And I was studying human because I was interested in humans. So I say like we have a similar sort of background and relationship to this this problem in in that sense. Um, and I just want to say in regards to the sort of including self reflectively the type of women that are producing this this third or fourth wave of feminism is that they really don't know, they're, they're mostly middle class women. They don't really know about the real life of women. And if you tell them about the real life of women in say Uganda or Madagascar or like wh wherever, like women, like wherever women are in the world, they don't want to hear about it. They'll actively repress any conversations about pregnancy, motherhood, child rearing. That it's not allowed to be talked about. You can take an entire gender studies class and childhood, motherhood, pregnancy, midwifery. Like we need to revive midwifery. 
that's my that's my big claim. We need to revive midwifery as and to me midwifery should be on the same level as philosophy. You have philosophy on the highest level as a typically masculine pursuit and I think midwifery should be an equally respected feminine pursuit which is as on the same level of conceptual significance and sex too, right? Paglia said that we shouldn't have gender studies, we should have sex studies. I mean Right. Well, okay. So it's if I'm all for building a gender studies, but gender, st like following Alenka Zupancic, uh, it's a gender studies which isn't neutered, quote unquote, but a gender studies which is actively engaged in the real of sexuality. So understanding gender not as just something that's created ex nihilo, like you create it like today I put on this band and I'm this gender, today I put on this band and I'm this gender. It's not like that. It's gender is something that is actually kind of like a reaction formation. Like I, I, I just, I think back again to what I keep saying is like, I remember when my body first masturbated me. Like I didn't choose to masturbate, my body masturbated me. And I just had this constant energy force flowing through me. And at that moment, I started to think about my gender. I started to think about what do I need to become, like how do I become a man? I remember strategizing. What would be the best things to do to increase the probability of getting a woman? Like I, I remember starting to strategize in my head <laughs> sexual identity roles, which would make sense given the coordinates of my sexuality. Mm -hmm. And all of my masculinity is a response in some sense to that because before you reach this genital uh, maturation point, you have a type of polymorphous perversity. You, you have a, child, a childhood sexuality, which is, yes, I have a penis. I noticed I had a penis and I noticed my sister didn't have a penis. We made this distinction. But still the full, the, still the full maturation of my masculinity requires, and I'm assuming also for women, the full maturation of their femininity requires a confrontation with the real of their sexual body. And, 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 and no, it's not a tight correlation, you know, like they absolutely um, exploit the fact that there's not an exact correlation between mind and body with, in regards to this. Like, for example, you can have a female body and you can be masculine in your presentation. That's totally possible. You can have a, a male body and be totally feminine in your presentation. That's totally possible. It's, yeah. But at well, the same well, my strategy for, for picking up women was to, to, to imitate them. Like I, I grew my hair very long. I acted all feminine and <laughs> I wasn't gay at all. I just, I thought that I should be like my mother, right? Um, no, I, I wasn't, I was totally obsessed with women, but I, but I, but, but I think, I, I don't know. I, I, that was, that, and my dad wasn't around. So, so I, that was my role model. So that's You were such amateurs, strategy. guys. Just ask a woman what she wants. <laughs> just like, yeah, well, there, yeah, this there you guest go. work okay. didn't do, go very far, did it? Right? No, no. Uh, <laughs> she probably, yeah, I, I just want to, but I want to, I want to, I wasn't, I wasn't finished. finished. Love Alexander, yeah. I, I, I wasn't finished my, my thought. So, um, what I want to what I want to get to, which I think is really like here, here, this is becoming the main point. I think is that I actually think because I, I you know because because I'm against this woke stuff. Sometimes I get these these weird reductions to someone who's anti woman or pro masculine, and it's not true at all. Uh, in fact, my main claim is that all this woke stuff is actually the the most harm I think is done to women in the end. And uh, it's kind of like similar to what Raven was saying about women who end up not having a proper developmental view of their identity, so they end up really unhappy, or the, we don't have this intergenerational feminine knowledge, um, which is also a problem. But I want to go to a more precise psychoanalytic point, which I actually developed from reading Lacan, which is that actually I'm very sympathetic with, with what I call, I'm very sympathetic with subjects in a female body because I think it's actually more difficult, objectively more difficult to be in a female body than to be in a male body in some sense. And it has to do with the, the strange nature of desire as one goes through the Oedipus complex. Because when you're, when you're in a male body, your desire just has to be, and if you're a man who's in this category that Bard's creating about you know, most men, is if you're in a male body, your desire merely has to be transferred from the mother's body to another female. 
So I remember, for example, asking my mother to marry me. I remember her saying, no, you can't marry me. And I remember thinking about the problem of how do I get another girl? And that seems like a difficult thing to do, but in principle, it's simple because I'm just transferring one desire drive onto another human being. Whereas for a female, whereas for a subject in a female body, it's more complex because not only because she wants the mother too, but what happens to her is that she has to turn her desire into herself, meaning that she's not going to get the mother, she's going to become the mother. And that's extreme, that's a traumatic turn. And if we don't have a proper way to help women confront this traumatic turn, that actually your desire is inverted. So for men, their desire is just transferred externally to another body. But for a woman, it has to go from the mother's body into herself. And that's a more difficult twist. And in that twist, in that twist, there's all sorts of identity complications. And I'm very sympathetic with this. And it's not clear, and psychoanalysis is, I think, clear about this, is that we cannot make mother the ultimate identity for subjects in a female body. It's true that they have to go through motherhood, many of them, and many of them want to. But it's still not the ultimate term for identity. And it is legitimate for women to want a life outside of motherhood. If you watch, for example, there's a fantastic old interview with Simone de Beauvoir, and she did very few interviews, but in this one interview with Simone de Beauvoir, uh, she, I mean, she, I think she ex expresses an authentic desire to, to be lifted from this um, perceived fate that the only destination for a female, for a subject in a female body is motherhood in the home, which it, it, it isn't and it doesn't have to be. But at the same time, it's still a passage that most women are going to want to go through. And I, I'm very sympathetic with how do we confront that horizon? And oh, I think okay. that, I, I got an answer. I, got I, just wanna, I just want to I just want to finish by saying I, wanna, I just want to finish wanna. by saying that that's that's why that's why I think we need to raise midwifery to the level of philosophy. OK, just a segue, Alexander, and then you can speak. Um, uh, I think we can learn a lot about all this stuff from watching old army of lovers videos. Um, anyway, go ahead, Alexander. Oh, duh, God, you really, you really lowered, you really lowered everything. There, right? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay, okay, no, the response to that is precisely the matriarch. That is precisely what Raven is talking about matriarchy. Women leave the production cycle, reproduction cycle, much earlier than men do. In any culture, women go into reproduction at about the age of 18. Men have to go out there and prove themselves, they come back when they're 28. So okay, between 18 years of age and up to maximum 40 years of age, say it's 30s, the early 30s, women reproduce. Then women go into the beyond the reproduction cycle, which is matriarchy. It is grandmothers who take care of babies in every tribe I've studied anywhere in the world, not mothers. That's why daycare centers are fantastic because daycare centers are again a renaissance of the tribal. They make sense. It's older women who take care of the kids and the kids learn how to take care of each other. That's why the nuclear family was a terrible institution and why much of the attacks on the nuclear family are well deserved. The nuclear family, as I always point out, was invented by a Prussian bureaucrat in 1813 and his purpose was not to make us happy. It was only to make us frustrated and productive. So, Skip the nuclear family, look at the bigger picture. Women have here, I think intergenerational here is key. And I think we all three, Raven, Cattle, and I at least here agree, probably Andrew too, that generationism is the current predicament of our culture. Mm -hmm. Every time I meet a woman who comes up to me, one of a discussion, they say, why don't you go and see an older woman for advice? What do you mean? Well, okay, what I teach men is to never ever discuss abortion between men because they don't get it. If anything, it's a question for the midwife rather than the philosopher, it's abortion. It's a perfect issue that men cannot even closely grasp because women can obviously postpone the birth of a certain child and allow another embryo to be that child three years later, whatever. It's just magical, mystical to me. But I think it's definitely, abortion is definitely the perfect example of something that is a discussion between the older matriarch and the woman who's inside the reproduction cycle. And I think this division between the younger woman is reproducing and the older woman who really is in charge of the entire tribe. We have to remember that the Supreme Court in the US Constitution is a feminine institution. It is the older woman to which all men are responsible. And if she doesn't get what she wants, there's not gonna be any fucking at all. There's no sexual ritual. There's no reward for the war and the hunt or whatever, because you guys haven't lived up to what you promised me you would do. 
Therefore, the cis-stratic complex closed down. That's what women naturally do as well. They close down their sexuality when men actually are completely lost. And so, so I think the answer to what Cattle addressed is that the matriarch is precise to that woman. That is precise about older women. Pagel would probably agree, are fantastic writers, express themselves. And I would even add, it's not just midwifery that should be on a par with philosophy, it should also be anthropology. Because what usually a female mind without testosterone does, when she wants to be a philosopher, she goes off and becomes an anthropologist. Hello, Camille Pagel. Hello, my girlfriend, Petra Stegrins, as many years. They're all anthropologists, right? So the, the, this, I think, is key to understand that it's intergenerational. And then we go back and look at men and patriarchy and discover it's the same problem there. We cut off the relationship between older men and younger men, and we told younger men they could be anything they wanted. They started looking around and thought they should all be shamanoids because after 1945, they had the shamanoids everywhere, so they thought they should be rock stars and go and kill themselves when they were 18 years old. Okay, we got that society. We got exactly that society now. And that's why young men hate themselves and go into depression and bipolarity, because even the most traditional sort of, you know, good masculine role models that most young men deserve to have in front of them and to look up to have been swept away and declared void and irrelevant in our contemporary society. And I think that's a big mistake. Okay, I think we need, I, we need a renaissance of the feminine. I think Raven personally represents yeah, that. Yeah. We need a renaissance of LGBT pride. Skip the cue. Okay, queer is just shamanoid. This is just out of the question. LGBT is what you fight for. LGBT is what you fight for globally. Anybody anywhere in the world can understand when you fight for endogenous people and their survival and their rights or whatever. I think LGBT classic and I think feminine, feminism classic are well-deserved. And in this case, this should be about pride properly. What do you contribute to society? Oh, look, here is what I do and I do best and here's my archetype and here's where I shine. Okay, I think that's awesome. Um, I have one more question, but I want to know if Raven has any comments on that before, before I go to the next question. Hmm. Well, I, I, I think that one of the things that really stood out to me about what Fidel said was about gender as reaction. And I think that that's something that I can say I personally experienced when going through kind of the, the transition from being this androgynous kind of child uh, into dealing with the kind of necessary changes that happen when you go through the dimorphic phase of dealing with your secondary sex characteristics emerging in your body when you're a teenager. And what I've kind of noticed through looking and listening to the stories of young, young women, women at like between the ages of like 14 and 20, when they're going through the transition into being women, that's a very critical Point where they tend to become interested in transness. Um, and there's a lot of work that's being done to kind of expose this. Um, and I think my kind of theory about this is related to what Cadell is saying about being a subject, you know, in a woman's body. And uh, that transition from the androgynous state of being a child and then having to kind of submit. You're submitting to these breasts that grow, your body is changing, like men start to look at you and you don't know how to handle that attention. And I think that there's this so insanely complex, you know, dynamic between men and women. And of course it's been very heavily explored, I think in like the uh, work of men where it's like, you have women who draw you in, you want them, they're like the prize, you also resent them you know, because they have this power over you. And there's like all of this complexity that's been explored um, on the side of like the male subject dealing with the female subject. But I think that women have similar kinds of feelings of, of being drawn to men, but also resenting them. And because, you know, they have to submit to their own bodies and their bodies are like, like, you know, especially in a de-sexed environment, right? Where we're all kind of, these different people whose our sexualities have been kind of checked at the door and we're supposed to pretend like we're not different kinds of bodies. Um, there's still, I think, this like kind of state that women suspect men to be in where they're still being sexualized, you know, and they resent that, you know, they resent that their friends want to fuck them. You know, they resent that they can't trust a man to just be interested in what a woman is thinking. You know, and I think that that is one of the complex aspects. And of course, on the other side with men, it's like, well, 
you know, a woman's talking to me, she just wants to get something from me. You know, it's both, both sides have their mutual resentment, you know, <laughs> or the other. Um, but I think that issue of, re of the kind of gender being this reaction seems to be critically important. And um, I don't know what it is about the era that we're living in, uh, but the kind of taking on of the androgynous is something that women are doing to protect themselves during this critical period where they're where they would be kind of moving into their very kind of fertile state of of peak femininity right like where they're really powerful they're like 18 you know they're just like beautiful right in this kind of the in-between state um and and instead they're you know cutting off their hair and wearing men's clothes like what is you know what is that and is that something that women in the past would have done had they had the option or is that kind of a phenomenon of our day and age and maybe Bard would, maybe it's related to kind of wanting to return to, to the infant state? I'm not, I'm not exactly sure, but it is a kind of strange phenomenon. Can I, can I, can I, can I, go ahead. I can, I can, I can, I can respond to that because again, for me, I have, again, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of sympathy to what I call subjects in a female body, because I, I, I do, I do think that um, it would be horribly annoying to like, for ex I mean, for example, like when I go outside and I go to the grocery store, I don't have to think about anyone coming up to me. I don't have to think about anyone giving me weird looks. I don't have, I just don't have to think about it. I don't, I, I can go out at any time of the night. I don't have to worry about it. I've had many women say like, you know, will we ever get to a place where I can go outside late at night and not feel like I'm in danger? And maybe no, <laughs> you know, like, I don't know if there's a solution to that. I don't think there really is a solution to that. But like, this idea of extremely beautiful women or women in their peak femininity wanting to be more androgynous is because the feminine in itself is kind of this cage or trap where you're reduced to not and it's where you're reduced to a power that's been given to you by nature but it's not necessarily something that you can build up and assert as your own determination but you but as a subject as a hegelian all subjects want no matter what body they appear in they want to build their own power and assert their own determination and tradi now traditionally now in the in the theory is that and this is to me very helpful in thinking about women as, as a man, is that a woman actually gets her phallus from the child. Mm -hmm. and, and, where, and what links a man and a woman is the child. So if you have all of these women in their peak femininity in between 18 and 30, say, as where they're now in traditionally, in traditional cultures, that would be the phase where you are um, regulated by the social substance to reproduce and the father would guide you and pass you to the husband and all of that would be regulated in complex but now it's all in a liberal individualistic society it's up to every individual determination yeah. and so now because it's up to every individual determination um, and women are by and large not wanting to have a child at 18. They want to go to school. They want to build a career. Maybe they'll have a child when they're 35. I know some women who say, for example, I wish I could delay having a child till I'm 250. You know, like, or, you know, like I wish I could push it back. I wish, I, I, wish I, I wish there wasn't this hard biological limit where I feel forced to reproduce before 35. I wish I had more time because, and there's this envy and jealousy at the man's body because there's not that same time limit. All of this, I'm very, like, I'm very sympathetic with all of these struggles. And I, and I do think that there is a way in which the, I think the type of xenofeminism, which uh, you and 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 um, your philosophical uh, Rachel, uh, her your philosophical queen's um, partner, was talking about, is there's an interesting conversation here, and 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 it's also interesting that you know, and Rachel's not here to t to talk about this either, but I, I think it's extremely interesting and worth a future conversation to say what 
is the place of transhumanism, xenofeminism in all of these movements? Because in my experience, there's lots of problems with transhumanist theory. It's mostly coming from men who are totally disconnected from women. So that's a big red flag. But at the same <laughs> So, but, at, but, at, but, at, but, at the, but at the same time, I think there's a conversation here worth going into and worth thinking because in my experience in academia, um, the tr you know, transhumanist theory wasn't really deeply uh, put into dialogue with all of these constructivist hypotheses. And one of the big theoretical interventions I would offer is, and it's basically a Hegelian notion, is that the, our construct the construction of our identities has to be grounded in a fully developmental notion of spirit. And when you have a fully developmental notion of spirit, you do have to think about intergenerational knowledge. You do have to think about the spirit as a totality as it's moving from five years old to 15 years old to 35 years old to 55 years old. Then you can think construction, but, but even then that's not enough because you have to think about the development of spirit as a historical totality and the development of spirit as a historical totality might involve the transcendence of humanity as such we don't know but there is but there is this gap where you cannot reduce the human subject no matter what body it appears to as some reproductive vessel at, at the same time many women want to be reproductive vessel but it can't be the final identity yeah, yeah, that seems to be the <clears throat> position of er, er, early feminists, right? Um, anyway, go ahead, Rachel, Raven. Yeah, I mean, what I was, I, I think the brilliance of the xenofeminists is they actually do pin down what the problem is. They say nature is unjust, change nature. Like, they actually get to the core. Like, if that's what you're reacting to, like, in terms of being a, a, a woman and a, a subject of a, of a woman and a woman's body, then, like, that really gets to it. <laughs> and it's, mo it's I'll let you I'll let you continue but I think that's yeah, much yeah. more sophisticated than smash the patriarchy because they think everything is the result of social um domination by men and they don't pay any attention to nature. But I mean the thing that you also mentioned right right was like transhumanism right okay so if this is a if this and designed by like disembodied men who are disconnected from women then like, hmm, red flag. But like, what about women who are disconnected from women? What about women who are disconnected from their own bodies? You know, what about women who are not actually fully kind of involved in what it means to be in a woman's body? Like, and and it kind of goes into this idea, I think, you know, of the superficial kind of definition of what it means to be a woman. A woman is a person who, can, who can't walk down the street at night. You know, a woman is a person who is like, com like, you know, condemned kind of to this like biological cycle that's not as favorable to the subject as, as a man. You know, a woman is a person who, you know, loses her reproductive capacity at 40. Like all of that to me is like a kind of a still in contrast with the male in a way that it almost reveals that women have kind of socialized themselves as these internal subjects as men, or at least have eroticized the kind of male position, um, the, the male subject and, and his kind of behavior in reality as a, as a process of like self-actualization, um, but haven't really looked at what it means for a woman to self-actualize. And I don't know, because the thing, the thing that I think, you know, kind of Bard illustrates with the matriarchy in the sense of like intergenerational uh, kind of coordination of the tribe is like woman is, is connected to this lineage, this like deep sense of lineage. I mean, her body is extended in, in the mother, in the grandmother, in the child, in the daughter, in the great great granddaughter. Like, almost like you're not you're not a subject in some sense like you're actually kind of in this kind of you know maybe we would you're like the mitochondrial dna you're like this um, umbilical cord between all of these generations and you're working on that level i think another possible tension here is like when you become post reproductive when you're a woman who's already had her children you especially once you hit menopause you're free. You are free. You are a free woman. Like, I think this is something that, you know, Camille really just, she, she, I mean, she's had an extraordinary life, but 
the way that she just is, is as an older woman is just absolutely incredible. She just doesn't, she really embodies what Taleb talks about as like the grandmother power. You know, the, the grandmother yeah. can come out yeah. and just admonish the young men and the young men, they like recoil in fear. <laughs> you know, they're like, yeah. oh my God, the grandmother. So we and need fierce, fierce matriarch Markle women. Uh, and we I, I've, I've, I've seen, I've, that and... just, to, just to connect the other way, I've seen this in Brazil in the jungle. Okay, so you got yeah. the rite of passage, you got the young man, he thinks he's so damn big muscles, a big dick and everything, <laughs> and he wakes up there and he's gonna be a warrior and a hunter, yeah. right? And this old woman, one tooth left, you know, purple, <laughs> walks up to him and she smacks him in the face, just like, it's you're nothing without yeah. me. I that is, with, that is wisdom my, speaking. Uh, and too. this is the key, I think. I, I think it sort of evens out. I, th I think the problem of contemporary feminism, and it's, it's dark shadow, it's based on the idea that men still are superior somehow to women. I don't know where that fucking idea comes from. It's ridiculous. It's historically ridiculous. It's just pathetic. No, the truth is that when, when it comes to, when you leave the reproductive age and you come out of it, and men are usually frustrated, and a lot of men get drunk and go and kill themselves or whatever, there are far more older women than there are older men in any culture you look at. And the older women are healthier way longer than the older men are. And as soon as a woman is involved as a matriarch, as a midwife, or even a brothel madam, as soon as a woman is involved in controlling sexuality and she's past the reproductive cycle, she shines. I think ultimately all stable structures over time, and this is where the court of law comes into the picture, are responsible to the matriarch. And I think this is essentially what, the only way for men to figure out where they're heading is to figure out where's the matriarch that we're supposed to report to. And that is called protection and provision. It's not all women you're protecting or providing for. That's again, a ridiculous Western nuclear family, absurd idea, right? Don't go even go there. It's like you're protecting and providing for a female collective, a female dominant collective called the inner circuit. The inner circuit is not only where children are being born and we have access to pussy, the inner circuit is what survives you. It's your transcendence. The transcendence for men is the inner circuit because your sons and your daughters are born within the inner circuit. They come out of it. Now, but to not understand how intensely central reproduction is to the human mind is to me ridiculous. This idea that we can somehow take ourselves away from reproduction and become something else. Well, the only thing we've ever managed to do besides reproducing bodies is reproducing minds and ideas. We are reproductive beings. Subjectivity is reproduction. It's central reproduction. And the only idea ever, besides just the eternal return of the same in sense of reproduction, is the quaint little possibility that the next return of the same could be slightly, slightly different than the previous one. That's the arrival of the event. It starts 4,000 years ago. And that's when men start experimenting with maybe not going to war or hunting. And instead of becoming war hunters, they're experimenting with maybe becoming engineers and traders. And women can settle down and they can finally provide for women in the sense that women can settle down. Permanent settlements start to be created and the population explodes. But we're still living with the consequences of that one decision we made some 5,000 years ago. It's called civilization. This is where Freud comes into the picture. Pag agrees strongly. She tells everybody, read Freud to get me. Exactly. Because if you don't understand that the idea of the event was thrown into the mix and the East stayed with reproduction, Chinese and Indian culture, affirmatively reproductive. That's why they don't understand patents and originality and things like that. They just copy like mad. Because that's what you do when you, you are eternally recurring. But the idea that you could create an event that changes history forever is a strictly male fantasy. Women are, women, are just with... looking at the, women are looking at the consequences of that. So the men come in through the door and women are better protected and better provided for and get more abundance. They can buy more shoes and go and talk to the gay guy at the hair salon, which, by the way, is a fantastic relationship. Gay guys are fag guys. That's really an intense, intimate relationship that is impossible. That is the potential of the impossible that she can study is between the gay guy and his fag guy in the hairdressing salon. But that's where women go to get understood and compare shoes and do whatever they're supposed to, to be part of the reproductive cycle and the post-reproductive cycle and whatever. And all men can do is maybe at times hope for achieving an idea or building a building or something that could impress women eventually so much that women <laughs> could admit that something novel just happened. No? Uh -huh. That's all there is to me. The male libido is nothing to that. It's just a tiny little boyish little protest against the big mortido women that rules the world. Uh-huh.
Okay, I want to bring the, the I want to ask this question, which goes back to the previous conversation uh, between uh, Cadell and Raven. And that's the question, I want to talk about sex again. Um, and I want to talk about the centrality of sex, how important is sex? Um, and uh, and uh, in that conversation, Tomas was critical of Cadell as, as thinking everything has to do with sex, whereas he th said that sex was a very simple thing and that we're over uh, psychologizing about sex. Um, and I was thinking of the, the uh, Hindu temples, you know, you, in front of the Hindu temples, you have all these gyrating sexual bodies. Uh, uh, you know, you have porn on the outside of the temple in, in the Hindu temples, right? Um, but on the inside, what's on the inside of the temple, right? Are people having sex? Or is that the most important thing, the central thing? Or, or uh, So I, I've been, I've, I've, I heard Cadell and what he said, and I heard Tomas, and I'm, I'm somewhere in the middle. So I wonder if you could... Give, give some clarification on, on one that. well one i i explicitly said that sex is not everything i explicitly said that sex is a persistent contradiction of reality oh, not sorry every, okay not, so not, sex not, is not, not every, not when everything. We talk to sex. Yeah. so let, let me let me try to let me try to connect this with bard central concepts of um this eternal return of the same or repetition or pro like process and event so you have repetition or process and then you have event um and you know, he links repetition to a feminine principle and he links event to a masculine principle. And, you know, in a lot of your Sweeney and Bard conversations, he makes, you know, basically the, the philosophical argument that the three major concepts that have been developed in history are, pro are repetition or process, then event. And then the third one is negation. And I know in your conversations with Thomas, uh, Thomas is skeptical of negation or doesn't quite understand negation or says it's obscure and Bard says um, just read deeper you eventually you'll get it um, and I know Bard says to me that I want you to write the negation one so let me try to explain what I what how I understand the link between this process and event and then negation so it is true that the more feminine consciousness is just interested in this returning of the same and the, es the essence is, is the reproduction. But the, like the major event or the emergence vector is the mind. And that's the, that's the major emergence vector. And it's true that we reproduce bodies and we reproduce bodies through the woman's body or the female body. But we also reproduce minds and ideas and the reproduction of minds and ideas, I argue, is becoming more and more important. And that's why, most, that's why most subjects in a female body are having such a hysteria about being in a female body. Because, no, it's an event. Uh, it, it's not going to keep returning to the same forever. Uh, there will be an event which changes everything forever. And th there will be an event. There will be an emergence vector. I don't know what it is. But there will be an event and an emergence vector where everything is transcended like we know. That's why it will be totally otherness. So it won't be that men and women as archetypes exist forever. No, they won't. And this is negation. This is negation. Any identity. Here's the, here's the crucial thing. With negation. Any identity that you think is permanent and fixed is not. I don't care how fixed you think man is or how fixed you think woman is or how fixed you think matriarchy is or patriarchy is. They're not so fixed that they'll be around forever. They will be negated. They will be overcome. There's process, there's event, and there's negation. And if you miss negation, you miss everything because you don't understand the full development of history. And in order to understand construction of identity, you have to understand the full development of history, and that requires understanding negation, which means understanding Hegel. Is that just death? I, I'm, I'm a little confused, like, uh, how you could say that, that this would end? I mean, they, they could human bodies reproduce as male and female. That's not going to end until we no, die. No no, 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 no. That's not the point, Andrew. Uh, okay. Uh, let explain to, this. explain yeah, to me, yeah. Because I think you actually catalyst the profit of negation on the process of the profit of the event. First of all, the overall principle is nomadology for all human beings. Raven and I talked about this before, that it's the war and the hunt, and before the war and the hunt is the priest and the chieftain. This division that goes on is all nomadological. It's all about getting on the move, moving into the future, moving into new territory, being on the move, because without being on the move, we die. And at the other end of that is the matriarch. And the matriarch in 
every tribe I've studied is the older woman who walks at the very back of the whole thing. But if you're behind her, you're dead. That's why chaos is always a goddess in all polytheistic religions. Behind her, death, chaos, you're dead. So you gotta walk in front of her. You're a little kid, you're a pregnant girl, you're a non-pregnant girl, you're an older woman, whatever, you gotta walk in front of her. Everybody walks in front of her, you're fine. If you're behind her, you, maybe you're shaved by the shaman or else you die. Okay, so the matriarch is like the last station. She's the reporting station. She's who you go to. And in front of her are all these beautiful women that then are, of course, for men, the reward system for sexual ritual. And for women, they are, oh my God, the rock stars are going to come in and look at me. Wow, sexually you're out. That's sexual ritual. Sexual ritual comes third, at least for men in the male fantasy, comes third after chief chieftain pre-separation, then war hunt separation, then it comes third in sexual ritual as a reward system that way often happens at night. So that's the proper place I think of sex. The nomadology is both genders, it, it's tribal, completely tribal. Event then occurs in the split between chieftain and priest. And if the priest imagines event as a chieftain personifies it. That's why Moses and Aaron are divided figures, for example, in the Jewish religion, where they rewrote the Exodus out of Egypt after Babylon. They rewrote it as a Zoroastrian fantasy with the two brothers are ahead. Moses and Aaron are separated. It's Aaron, the chieftain, who takes the people into the promised land. It's Moses who dies on the mountain of Sinai. He will not walk into the promised land to remind people that you're the priest. It is the journey, the Exodus, that's important. But to the chieftain, he personifies the actual achievement. That means it's his sons that are going to populate the promised land, and Moses will be no more. He's over and down, but he's out. And this split is where the event comes into the picture. So the event must always be process and event. If we understand event as without process, we get all the big predicaments we ride with in the West, starting in the Middle East and Europe, which is called Gnosticism. And this is what I'm fighting now, using negation to understand it. Because Gnosticism is essentially the idea that event can be without process. Now, why would a man ever Imagine a world without the sexual intercourse with a woman. Oh, he would if he loves mother so much that he doesn't want mother to go to father. And he would if he wants the girl to stay a girl without becoming a woman. And he would want both those two things if he doesn't want to be a grown-up man. He only wants to have the phallic power that he's obsessed with, but he doesn't want to pay the price that it means to be a grown-up man and surrender to constraints and negation. Negation is the name for growing up. Mm -hmm. Negation cuts you short, yeah. kills your fantasies and throws you into reality. That is what negation is, historically speaking. So in this case, for me, when I work with it, with the sort of work the cattle does, is that I work with negation to understand why Hegel and Lacan were so adamant. Lacan said there's no meta language, there's only language. Can I violate, what about I sacrifice? One word that came, came to I, me I just, I just, I just want, I just want to violently agree with Bard here, oh, yeah. because I am absolutely, <laughs> I am absolutely sick to death of these phallic, these very phallic-centric men who do not understand negation. I'm sick to death of them. I cannot stand them. They, 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 have, they, have, they have no ability to be dialectical. They have no ability to understand the knowledge of others, and they have no ability to engage with others. It's absurd, and, I've, I've, I mean, and they, they run the academy. I think the word for, that came to mind, if you don't mind, is sacrifice. That that that's close to negation, or maybe that's just prior to negation. No, 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 no. Sacrifice, no. like that, yeah. like Moses is sacrificed, right? In a sense. No, no. What, I've been no. careful to use the word <laughs> okay. sacrifice here because sacrifice could actually be something that happens much later. I would say adultification is tied mm -hmm. to negation. What that is that. Mm -hmm. When that old woman smacks you in the face in the tribe and tells you you're nothing without her, she cuts you short. In West Africa, they give you a bow gun. You go through hell for 72 hours, and then you completely submit to the tribe, as the young men you are. This is what you need to do with young men. You need to make them completely submit to the tribe, because without that submission, there will not be men, and they will certainly not be allowed to fuck any woman in the tribe or neighboring tribes at all. They're not, they're not ready for that at all. No woman will fuck them. No woman fucks a narcissist. Mm -hmm. No, you don't. Yeah. 
No, you fuck a guy who's proudly taking responsibility and has a role within the patriarchy and comes into the room and the other men look up to him. Wow, that's a star. That's the guy I'd love if I can have him. That's who, that was female sexuality does in relationship to men yeah. for all the right reasons. So men and, become and, attracted and, to women uh, based okay. on feedback so, from each other, not from the women in a sense. So the problem here that feminism addresses if you look at it as a shit test, if you look at the queer movement as a shit test, if you look mm. at these things as shit testing, all the patriarchy, that went wrong. I would say it's not patriarchy itself. It is a certain patriarchy that is inherited from Gnosticism. And I, this is why I'm, I'm very critical of Christianity and Islam, because Christianity and Islam were both these pop religions that took the original ideas out of Zoroastrianism and Judaism and Vajrayana Buddhism, by the way, all these sort of religions that were respectful have a military religion here, they have a priest religion, your religion is about men. It's all about controlling men and taming men. Women just reap the benefits of good religion. With this bad religion, it comes back, it worships women and children. That's what women should watch out. When women start wor worshiping women and children, they should sort of watch out a lot. Wait a second, men should get their shit together. The way to get your shit together is called religion. That's why I love bullfighting. Because then men learn how to tame nature. And women love it because the Toreador who just killed the bull might have her next. He's probably a good fuck for all the good reasons because the guy should sort out his shit first within the patriarchy and then come back and then woman can say, yeah, I'm with you or no, I don't want you. That's the female position. And the Gnosticism is the problem. This is why I go back to the axial age with Sodokrist and our work and we're gonna go through this in the Protestant event book we're working at the moment because the Gnosticism is the little boy who's 11 years old I either call him the boy pharaoh, that's the guy who has pathos and hates logos, or he's the pillar saint and he's the guy who has logos and hates pathos. And both these two boys, the pillar saint and the boy pharaoh, are the problem. Because they fantasize about an event without process. So they fantasize about perfection, they fantasize about infinity, and they fantasize about immortality. Now you understand why I was a part in creating transhumanism and left it. Now I understand why I'm adamantly opposed to Silicon Valley. I'm opposed to any of these sort of Platonistic cultish places full of little boys who want to marry their mother and stay with their mother the rest of life and want girls to stay girls and boys to stay boys and hate grown-ups and hate adult responsibility. And they're the ones who are really removed from God because the only way to get closer to God as a human is to grow up. Bard, yeah. can, I, can, I, can I jump in for a moment? So I, I want to I want to inject here sort of a point of view where I um, I was inspired by your conversation with um, Sweeney Bard and and Hammerlick where you guys were talking about um, religion and um, you know Thomas specifically pushed back on your um, critique of Christianity and Islam and then in this in this particular example you just gave, you're saying you're critical of Christianity and Islam because of inherited Gnosticism. But I don't think Christianity can be reduced to Gnosticism. And the crucial point here, which Thomas raised, which I agree with completely, is that there's no God behind Jesus, that there's kind of an absent void. And I think that this form of Christianity radically castrates this, uh, this sort of Gnostic fantasy. Um, and I think that it, it introduces one to a knowledge of lack and it introduces one to a knowledge of negation. And that I understand that your emphasis on religion and Zoroastrianism, and I think it's a really, like to me, your, your observations on Zoroastrianism are absolutely interesting. And for me, they, they, link, they link an entire understanding of historical religion, which I was unaware of. And I'm 100% um, you know, indebted to you for this observation, really with Zoroastrianism, but with your process and event, there's still yet to be understood to integrate negation. And here would be my challenge for Christianity and Islam, is that I'm not saying we should identify with Christianity and Islam. I don't think, you know, for me personally, I don't really want to identify with any of the religions, but Christianity and Islam as historical phenomenon, they are making sense of sexual difference in confused ways. But they do try to make sense of sexual difference. And it could be that their popularization in history was necessary to hold sexual difference. Because if whenever I go to a religious space, whether it's a Christian space, whether it's an Islamic space, whether it's a whatever type of, they, hold, they try to hold sexual difference. And, I'm, I'm, I think, and I think it's an incredibly difficult thing to do. And it, to me, it brings us to to me, it brings us to understanding the Holy Spirit. 
And that might be that. I don't know. It's just it's just a provocation. But I, I think there's an interesting conversation here. Yeah, I, no, just, no, I, I, I just I want agree. to say we have five minutes until we're going to open up the Q and A. Um, and so, so I, this is amazing. Uh, this I love this. I could I could bring in Judaism here, but I'm not going to tonight because it's too long of a conversation. I will, Andrew. I will. Um, I, but but in five minutes, I'm going to open up the Q and A. Okay. Okay. So my response to that is yes, of course, there are good things with the pop religion that was spread widely and, and it was so easy and simplistic. And, and, but the problem with Islamic Christianity is precisely by removing the bar to absolute and maybe God and human beings directly accessible to one another. You get one version where God has is direct access to humans, which is Islam, and the other one where humans have a direct access to God with Christianity. They no longer work and they were failed. They, they were false. That I totally false agree answer. with you. And that's why the origin of both religions is Gnostic. So if you study the history of the Middle East, you discover that Zoroastrianism and Judaism fight with these things. Christianity and Islam has then later fought with these things. So they tried to sub submit these things. But if you look at the actual construct, you can do postmodern rereadings like Girard for as much as I care about Christianity and Islam. But at the end of the day, certain gods will die as we go along. That's part of the Gation. Hello. And I think it's time to declare Islam and Christianity dead. Islam was the fake copy of Zoroastrianism. Christianity is the fake copy of Judaism. I'm not trying to save Zoroastrianism and Judaism because they are way older, they've looked at these issues way longer, and they've never submitted to the false idea that God and man can have direct access to one another. Because they can't. We, we can't have direct access to the divine. They, they, because we've we got to grow up first. We've got to become adults. And only when you're an older matriarch an older patriarch, and you are the reproduction cycle, and your subjectivity is like you're laughing at yourself, and you eat goose liver pâtés or whatever, and people come to you and they ask for advice, and you just kindly, pragmatically give them wisdom, your wisdom, and what's the best thing to do in life. Well, when I was your age, I made that mistake. Don't make my mistake. Here's what you should do instead, just to save you some time. Okay. These kind of older women and older men is what's lacking in contemporary society because we started worshiping the teenager in the 1950s when the phallus was gone. The phallus was out the door and instead we started worshiping youth with all the damn Botox injections in the skulls of 24 year old women today. There's so many warning signs that we've lost track. And yeah. this for me is the return. The return today is the return to look at tribal structures and realize we're all winners because we have evolutionary around. These are archetypes. There's some of them are shamanoid. Here's some queer guys, and there's lots of women and men. And here's reproduction, by the way. That is also our future. That's heritage for as long as we know. It probably will stay for quite a while. And on top of that, we do have a little time set aside if we're exploring a few ideas. Okay, I have a question. I got to mute this guy. Uh, now, Andrew, now you're, you're muted. I just promoted everybody to panelists, which means now we can ask some questions. And I have one question from my good friend and fellow Vajrayanist, uh, Colin Morris. Uh, uh, I'm, uh, he's the host of a, f a fantastic podcast called Zion 2.0. Colin, go ahead and, and uh, ask your question. Great. Thanks, Andrew. This, is, <laughs> this has been such an awesome conversation. It's good to see some old faces again, like Alexander. And I actually just had a conversation with Raven about some of these similar topics just yesterday. Um, and the thing, that, the thing that I feel like is most top of mind for me right now is the, the relationship between these ideologies that seem to be pretty dominant right now, transhumanism being one of them, um, even, even when it's not explicitly articulated as a coherent philosophy it is the philosophy of people who dominate these large tech platforms who now have the power to censor speech they're they're sort of diverting and shaping the narratives and putting these memes into people's heads and and since this conversation is a lot about gender i wonder what the relationship between the woke conception of being trans what what it actually means to be a trans person and transhumanism to me, or what, what's the, the relationship? Because transhumanism to me feels pretty, pretty anti-human. Um, and, uh, and as like, as somebody who, who is in this sort of esoteric Buddhist tradition, we kind of understand that gender is fluid and you don't have to reify 
that and, and sort of change your body in a material way to become this sort of um, to, to feel more real or to feel more whole or something. Um, so yeah, I just, I, I, I'd love to hear, I'd love to hear you guys respond to that. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll get, take the first one here. Love you, Colin, to bits. Colin is my favorite adoption material in the world. If I could steal <laughs> somebody's kid and have it to myself, I would take Colin right away. Okay, uh, I would say the problem with both Silicon Valley and transhumanism is these, these sort of new tech movements are sort of early stage internet and uh, they're run by 25 year old boys who are terrified of, of big dicks and, and, and fucking proper women. So uh, they're boys, they look up to moms and at best they marry a mom. And, and yeah, obviously that some of them have done that and, and become much better men because of it. But the problem here is that this is Platonism returning in a big way. And it's vulgar Platonism to be honest about it as well. It's not even educated, learned Platonism at all. And that's exactly why woke culture is now completely taken over Google and Apple and these companies. They, 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 were, com they were not immune at all to this. They, they were completely naive. They wouldn't understand this sort of, they, that they were being used as old institutions that could be taken over by people who are greedy for power and, and wanted to control these things. And now they're diversity officers and whatever at all these places, right? And th th this is what happened with Silicon Valley. And as far as I'm concerned, it's dead and over. And I really hope we quickly can have other tech platforms because we're all leaving Facebook in droves right now. We hate it. Uh, it, it cynical in the way that only, only little Platonist boy with a serious autism problem could actually employ thousands of psychologists at Facebook to make people addicted to Facebook. If that isn't evil, I don't know what evil is. I completely agree with Douglas Ruskoff. But that's what happens when little boys gets too much power. That's you writing a philosophy of boy pharaohs and pillar saints to try to understand what Gnosticism, what kind of havoc it has actually caused on humanity for the past 4,000 years. It's been a curse. And, and I'm totally anti-Gnosticist. That, that, that's my work. And what I'm saying is that you need to bring, for example, some older women and men into these rooms. They're called boards usually, and they tell you, shut the fuck up, because you don't even know what a human is. A human is a body and a mind. It will be for a long time to come. The negation of that will still have to wait. For a long time to come, human beings will have body and mind, and hopefully body and mind will collaborate, and that's a decently harmonious human being. And if you don't even understand what that is, you can't run a platform on which all these people are supposed to dance. Transhumanism, I was part of in the 1980s when it started, but I saw right away, you had these guys who walked into the room and they didn't look very good. And you know, they, these were the kind of guys who hated everything that was beneath their throat but they were very, very literal and verbal and very funny, very, you know, a lot of times. I could not, in my wildest imagination, the early 1990s, expect the transhumanism would fill the huge void and become the big popular movement it has begun. I was naive about transhumanism's attractive values. But as far as I'm concerned, I'm not interested in Platonism. And whenever I see it, I want to kill it and remind people it's hubris. And the way I really pissed them off is basically by telling them that the moon landing in the 1960s was a catastrophe because it was, because it held back human civilization for another 30 years, because it spent hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars on doing what? Since putting a fucking flag on a rock where nobody can live. Now, if that isn't hubris and idiocy, I don't know what that is, right? So, so I, I think it's really a good time now to sort of be awakened about this because we have to get those platforms out there and the data flows out there that work for us in a sort of human civilized way and that could actually be sustainable into the future. Do you have a follow-up, Colin? Anything you want to, else you want to say? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Alexander. The, the, there's one piece that, that I'd love you to touch on and that is this this woke idea of what it means to be trans and the connection between tr being a trans person and like not feeling whole in your body and how that is connected to transhumanist ideology. And if there's some kind of like, I mean, Raven and I talked about this yesterday, like the idea of it being a psyop, like a psychological operation feel, may maybe is a bit of a stretch, but just the, but the, the idea that this the ideology is kind of being dispersed and it feels like a mind virus. Can we just get rid of this idea that human beings are natural? <laughs> can, can I, can I, when, when the matter cuts the umbilical cord, it's a cultural act, okay? Uh, we've been cultural for thousands of years. The reason why we have the big genital organs that we have, the big tits and the big dicks that we actually do have compared to other mammals is because of cultural effects over evolutionary time. We are cultural beings. When you put on makeup, you're trans. Makeup is trans. Trans is just adding 
Again, event added to process, not opposed to it. Trans is just adding value. To me, transsexuality is a great artistic experiment in adding more value to femininity and masculinity, not taking something away from it. And I think it's great that we can put hormone shots into ourselves and I'm <laughs> curious about it. And I share with anybody who tries to do that. I think there's shamanoid and queer when they do it. Is it for the majority of people? Of course not. Gato, you wanted to say something? Uh, yeah, or, or Ra Raven, did you want to respond to this gender question? Or if not, I, I, I can, well, we can both respond to it. Yeah, you can go ahead. Mm -hmm. I also have something to say, but, you know. I'll just say very quickly that I think it's really interesting that there's a convergence between the woke conception of gender and the transhumanist conception of gender, because I think basically they both are struggling with the body from different angles. It might be the woke side is coming from the feminine struggle with the body more, and the, the, the tech singularity transhuman side is probably struggling with the body from the more male side. And that makes sense then that the, the, the tech, the, the transhumanist side is trying to resolve the problem with the body with a type of ridiculous Platonism. But as Bard said, it's not really sophisticated Platonism. It's scientists themselves who don't read philosophy stumbling upon Plato and without even knowing they're doing that. And then the feminist side or the woke side is trying to resolve the problem of the body with a type of Deleuzean multiplicity. And neither of them work. So, so, but both of them are struggling with lack. And both, and like, that's why, that's why, that's why Bard is emphasizing the big dick thing. Because they're both struggling with lack. And so the quest, the question is, what is the, what is the role of lack in const, and what is the role of negation in constituting the struggle between the mind and the body? And that, and that hasn't yet been articulated, and I would just argue that Buddhism doesn't solve it. But it, there has to be a solution to it, and to me, it needs to have a conversation about religion. And that's why I think all of our conversation, and, and Buddhism is not technically a, a, a religion like Zoroastrianism or Judaism or Christianity or Islam, which actually try to formulate a theory of the historical development of all spirit, and the historical development of all history, which requires understanding process, event, and negation. And so I'll leave that to you, Raven. Yeah, I mean, I was going to say something quite similar, where I think it, it, it does relate to this idea of gender being um, a kind of reaction to the condition of the body, and that, like, that being this, like, point at which something like transhumanism or, or the ideology of transness can latch, you know, into, into the mind. And especially, I mean, you would kind of imagine it to be emergent in some sense, like where you have all of these technological tools of intervention and you also have youth worship, uh, you know, that people would begin to reach for these things uh, and then reactively kind of justify them to themselves. And that kind of process of wanting to manipulate one's own body, and I mean, it's it's also just kind of consistent throughout human history. I don't know, maybe we would kind of see this link to a certain type of paganism, but certainly there's body modification all over human history that kind of like elevates, you know, these kind of, uh, and, and maybe this is the point you're making, Alexander, about this all being kind of a cultural thing. Um, and that type of adornment or like that kind of excessiveness. But I think the point that Alexander made about it being uh, whether or not transness is additive, it's kind of about kind of expressing and extending the sense of one's body into the world, or if it's subtractive, it's about like kind of removing or like mutilating, maybe the kind of place where we can explore wh where is the kind of pathological experience of, of engaging with these tools and what is the kind of exalting or transcending, truly transcending kind of experience with these tools. I agree strongly. <laughs> Raven, can I just ask that? Yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. A comment I want to make on Ray. Okay, so transsexuality is again one of these things. If you don't understand it, stay out of it. Just like I leave abortion completely to matriarchy to solve abortion issues. Don't let men get close to that issue. The same thing here. There's a really maturing debate within the LGBT community, which is in itself a transsexual community to be honest about it. And 
the question is to, to now, which is very addressed, is that transsexuals are coming out, they've done, you know, successfully even got the tits and everything, and they look like women. And in a superficial way, they are women. They call themselves trans women, and they admit exactly what they are. They have a very clear ontological definition of what they are. But they're now having a debate about, maybe I was the gay guy who just felt pressured, and because the makeup boxes were there, and suddenly the surgery option was there, and I decided to go for it to get to fuck straight guys, and discover in the process that was it me who wanted to be transsexual or was it just that I gave up on being a gay guy and fighting for the right to be a gay guy and it was just easier for me to become a woman. And this maturing discussion is incredibly interesting because it's precisely out of these discussions that really involve events and negations, by the way, it's precisely out of these, this type of discourse that something really creative will come out. And I would just love to leave it like that right now for the transsexual community to solve that issue between themselves. I think it's really, really interesting what's going on in that community because we can all benefit if the androgynous can redefine who they are in relation to men and women in general so they can go back to the place where they can deliver. And I give an example of that. For example, I was always sort of fascinated that women started attacking fashion models for not looking like women. Okay, because women, uh, the fashion models were like women who looked like transvestites. Yeah. Why do they look at transvestites? Because gay men want men, women to look like that. No, transvestites look like gay men who want to look like women. That's precisely the point. Because gay men design fashion for women. Why do they do that? Because in the masculine energy of the gay man is a daring and a risk-taking that women don't have. Because risk-taking is an exclusively masculine trait, just like giving birth to children is a very feminine trait. That's how women survive and men die. You know, men die in battlefields. Men, die, men are always in the minority compared to women. Women are excellent survival machines and they get away with everything. And, and we have to keep that in mind. They're actually very good at surviving. Okay, but men do die, so men take more risks. So what the gay guy does is that instead of dressing himself in women's clothing, he puts the women's clothing on a woman who looks like a gay guy, a fashion model, so she can walk into the room and basically it's a hanger on which he's put the clothes. And a hanger looks best when it's what? Big shoulders, thin body, slim all the way down. Nobody ever claimed that fashion models were sexy. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's like straight guys are supposed to think that it, they like the clock form of the body and, you know, the, the big breasts and, you know, the shape and all. Hips what, and breasts. Yeah, yeah. the 1950s pinup <laughs> girl. That's what yeah. men are turned on. Nobody <laughs> ever, nobody ever claimed that fashion models, the supermodels of the 1990s and the, the double knots, they were somehow sexy. No, they were these sort of women who looked like gay men's idea of what a fashion model should look like. Because the purpose here was to put daring clothes onto a model so you could dare women to dare wearing these clothes. And the problem was because of AIDS again, most of the talented gay guys went in through the door, they fucked themselves to death, did too much drug because they lost their friends or whatever. And then women started Signing their own clothes. And like I always say sarcastically, when women started signing their own clothes 10 years ago, it all became beige. And it's the same beige every season. And I'm kind of bored with it and fashion is dying because the talent that was the gay man who loves women and want women to look their best and striking and shocking and have colors and wigs and more, look more than they are, is gone. The artistic okay. side of women is gone. And, 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 and Bart. I love this speech, Art. Alexander. I love it. I, 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 I want to ask, I want to ask, uh, address some of the questions that are coming through on YouTube. Can um, I just, can I just say, I also love Bard's little speech here and that the, the ultimate figure for what, who you're talking about today, the, I mean, you're absolutely correct, but the ultimate figure here that embodies what you're talking about is RuPaul's drag show. With RuPaul, like he's getting, bringing all that back and stuff. I love, but sorry, Andrew, go ahead. No, that's okay. I mean, this is, this is a great topic. Um, there's a question on, on, uh, on YouTube, and it's about negation. Um, me and Cadell have this argument kind of about Buddhism and Hegel, and, and, and I think Buddhism invented negation, and Hegel and, and Cadell, Cadell thinks that Hegel invented Buddhism or something. Or, uh, anyway, um, somebody from YouTube asks, what, what's blocking men from understanding negation? And what form of social change would it take to shift the paradigm towards a clear understanding of negation? Okay, well, uh, the, the, so what, okay, so let me first say about this Buddhism Hegel thing is that I don't deny that Buddhism um, knows what negation is on the first level 
because it asserts the void as the void of the self, the no self self, and and all this type of stuff. But it doesn't. Under, yeah. But it doesn't understand the negation of the negation, which is the historical mobilization of negation, and that leads into all sorts of paradoxes, which we're able to talk about contemporary identity and even the historical overcoming of all contemporary identity. But the question that was asked on YouTube, what would it take for men to understand negation, is to stop basically. Um, uh, thinking like unconsciously thinking that their phallic drive is the all like Kurzweil does this Kurzweil is the, the Kurzweil's the perfect and I know this because I studied Kurzweil very deeply so Kurzweil basically confuses his phallic imaginary fantasy with the all with the absolute and this and he even goes to extreme levels like if you read Kurzweil's The Singularity is Near read it as a psychoanalytic exercise so what Kurzweil does with his, with his phallic fantasy of the all is he, um, first he spiritualizes the entire planet, the entire spirit, the entire spirit, the whole planet becomes covered in spirit. All matter is turned to spiritualized substance. And then all of the universe is turned to spiritualized substance. And the entire universe wakes up as some absolute, but this is all only his phallic erection. This is only his, him confusing his phallic erection with the all. So basically what men have to do is understand lack, which is to basically realize that their phallic fantasy, that there are other phalluses. They need that what they need, what they, what they need is an, what they need is an event. And that event has to be a con, a, a, a traumatic confrontation with a bigger phallus or something like that. Okay, I have a comment. Put them in their place. I have, I, I have a I, comment. I hold on, hold on, hold on. I have a comment from our favorite phallus here um, on Parallax, and that's Thomas Helmerich. He, and I think it's apropos to, to what you're saying. He says, we think sending a big penis-shaped vessel on the moon was a great phallic accomplishment. He's fantastic. I love Thomas the tricks. There you go. Can I respond to that? Cattle is brilliant here. Absolutely brilliant here. Okay, so I would say that Hegel's great contribution in the history of ideas and the third idea that we talked about should really be negation of the negation, not negation itself. That, that's given. That, that was there all along. So negation for men in general, just negation, is to no longer think that the world can be perfect. It must be imperfect because perfection was thought through, which is horrible. To understand that you will die one day and it's the fact that you will die one day that will give everything you do in your life any sort of meaning and that comes for all mortal beings. So that's precisely the point. And, and, and to understand that nothing is infinite ever, everything is finite. There are finite resources, finite ends to everything that happens. So you lose fantasy, you lose dreams. And this is supposed to start at about one year of age with something called the phallic intrusion. The phallic intrusion means you get a tooth in your mouth, you've been sucking your mother's tit, you worship it, and a phallus walks by and you don't have it. Because you have a tiny little boy penis, right? and you're, a, you're not interested in pedophiles. So did something weird walk by, huge big dick walk by. It's not you, but something in you wants that because you want to get away from the mamilla. And this journey away from the mamilla towards the phallus is childhood. And the phallic intuition is basically, you don't have phallus, boom, negation. That's the first major negation. And then you look at the mamilla and you realize that you must start hating the first, this is Julia Kristeva, by the way, it's female psychoanalysis. You must start hating for the first time in your life because you must start hating the thing you loved because if you go back to the mill again, you will never ever grow up and you can never ever be phallus. So that's the first negation. Negation is basically your entire life is just, oh no, not that. Oh no, not that. Oh no, not that. It's killed dreams and killed fantasies all the time. To then affirm and realize that that's what freedom is. The freedom you get is that, oh, I... That dream died, but because that dream died, there's an opportunity for something that is finite, imperfect, mortal, and therefore way more interesting than a little boyish fantasy about infinity and perfection. Before you can, before you can dream properly, you have to lose everything because the ego, the ego wants to stage a fantasy of winning. And it won't stop staging this fantasy of winning. It has to be everything's perfect, infinite, immortal, and it just wants to keep staging that, it has to lose everything. And then you can dream properly. Okay, well, we have about, let's say 10 minutes. Are, are there other... Are there
further questions from, from the audience? Does anybody want to unmute themselves? Because we've got a bunch of people here and, uh, and yeah. or, or does anybody, yeah, Dimitri wants to say something. Go, go ahead, Dimitri. Yeah, um, yeah, towards all of you. Uh, yeah, it was a great talk. Very interesting, so many complexities. I'd love to explore it all. Um, I'm fairly new to this, so it's <laughs> quite complex. But yeah, that's what it's about. Um, Alexander, I had a question about what this all is about, um, like what we are exercising here collectively or trying to do, and like politically rejecting the wokeness is kind of what's the relation with this and religion and politics? Are we creating a new religion? Are you doing this? And then also a question was like, so how does this relate to the Exodus? Is this a physical Exodus? Are you saying we will create a community and move to this place and do this? Or how does this relate to uh, the internet and like the global society? It's a big question. So yeah, that, that's it. Okay, I'll turn it around. Uh, the exodus to digital is to find out actually what digital really is and what potential it has. So digital is a pharmacon. It's like the atomic bomb. It can either be used for good things or it can just destroy us. So the question is, do we in time actually do with digital what we could do? And I'm not asking that question to humanity in general because I think that case is just lost. I'm asking that to the people who are concerned with it and interested in that topic. And that's why I'm talking about the chosen ones. Basically, all of humanity is offered to participate, a few of them will. And those who are concerned with these issues and are interested in them artistically or philosophically or whatever, will more or less create their own subculture or tribe and then conduct some kind of an exodus. The thing though is that we both bought in mind so we don't literally have to move from one country to another one, although that could very much be a part of the mix. Migration, for example, leaving Europe, moving to America, those things, exodus have happened in the past. But exodus don't necessarily have to be territorial, physically, they can also be in the mind. And that is why I'm also doing paradigmatics in my work, which is how do you move from one era to another era? And woke culture here is essentially, um, it's sort of a revenging shit test from the old paradigm. It's like the last ghosts. It's like the last demons, like the last ugly, horrible ghosts from the old paradigm are like, you know, jumping at the old institutions. They're into politics. They're into mass media. They're into academics. They go after the last resources in the last old dying institutions that the rest of us are left behind and try to take over the institution. And from there, they shout and scream at digital and say the word evil or whatever happens, there's evil and call it fake news, or whatever they do. That's what world culture does. But my, my opposition to world culture is very simple. I'm opposed to any culture that celebrates victimhood. I think as soon as you be declared a victim, you should try to go into heroic mode. I've never ever in my entire life ever met a human being or a human collective of any kind that was helped by being declared victims. The second you accept a victimhood label on your culture, you will drag yourself down the drain and you will kill yourself in the process. You'll become a zombie or a living dead in the process. It's deeply unfair to yourself and your community to declare that you're victims, you need repatriation and you've been unfairly treated in the past, you can fix your own shit. The heroic mode is absolutely central to me. This is where Pavel agrees with me. This is where Jordan Peterson agrees with me. I'm sure Slavo Shishik agrees with me because essentially it's both Marxist and it's Nietzsche and it's certainly Hegelian, is that any thriving culture throughout history has to go into the heroic mode. And this is, for example, in my work, I find the people who could easily have become victims and had a really, really tough, rough life. And I always put them on the stage and said, if this guy or this woman can stay heroic, then all of us can. So my, that's my only attack against world culture. I'm exposing it for being a Rousseauian lynch mob that celebrates victimhood. And, and wants nothing good, there's nothing good in it. There's a rusty way, it's only druj, it's not asha. It, it's a destructive spirit that only wants the resources, but he wants the resource to be decoupled from the contribution. And I think that's deeply inhuman. I, think you, I don't think human beings can handle it at all. Okay, uh, so um, go ahead, Dimitri, uh, one, follow up. A yeah. little question more. Is that, so uh, did I get it right that you care about this minority of people who, you know, are um, consciously trying to work with all these issues? But, but what about the rest? 
I, I don't care about the rest. It's not my job. <laughs> okay. It really isn't. Human beings can take care of each other. At least they should. You know? Why I love to be in this conversation is that Raven is here. And Raven, for me, personifies, in a messianic sense, woman, feminism, LGBT, all the things that I love and that we talk about in this discussion. I would love for Raven to talk more, but, you know, I, I yes. can't talk a bit because too much. We have to hear a few more things from Raven, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. But Raven personifies what this discussion is. So the men about. don't dominate the conversation as they usually do, right? <laughs> yes, okay, okay. I'm getting used to it, okay. Um, well, I don't know. I guess what was coming up for me, just in my mind, in relation to this, is, like, how people deal with being the abject. Um, this kind of comes up, I think, with uh, confronting motherhood, for example, and gets back to this idea of, you know, being a subject in a woman's body. I think one of the things that I've done a lot of kind of like, I, I call it my mother's simulation, um, but it's like kind of thinking about being hated by my child, you know, like that kind of experience, I think, is extremely painful for a mother to go through. And I think that that's just a kind of microcosm for what it is that um, many groups go through uh, when, if they become the abject. So you can see this happening with white men. There's a lot of like men who've decided or elected themselves as like victims to becoming abject by like this LBGTQ thing. Uh, obviously the LBGTQ group feels like they're abject for heteronormative society and so they've declared themselves victims. There's also, we also see this obviously in the United States with um, like with, with black people who are like, well, we've been victim like we, we've become, we've been abject, so now we are victims. Um, so there, there seems to be this kind of like split between uh, the victim in the kind of narrative that comes out of being abject and the heroic narrative. And you can, find, you can find people who kind of go in either direction, but for whatever reason, and maybe this is due to kind of the, um, I don't know, uh, qualities of the internet, but definitely it seems like the victimhood cult uh, spreads so much <laughs> like, um, and kind of overwhelms uh, anybody who who is heroic and maybe maybe we could relate this to people being afraid of the phallus um, and the kind of desire to yeah go back into the mamilla go into the matrix and not to kind of accept this heroic stance of going forth into the into the future and asserting oneself in in reality even though you are abject I mean I think that's the other thing is like you are abject and this seems to be the case with many people who stand up, like anybody uh, who, I mean, Jordan Peterson's a great example. What a polarizing figure. But even amongst groups of people who I consider to be open-minded, qualify when they bring up Jordan Peterson. They're like, yeah, you know, I'm not that big into Jordan Peterson, but, you know, he said this amazing thing. You know, this is the kind of thing that people find themselves doing. It's apologizing for being interested in these, these abject figures. And... Um, so there's something about the heroic and the abject. Maybe this gets into the kind of what it is to be a messianic type of figure. Um, obviously, you know, if you look into the New Testament, Jesus talks about that. He's like, you know, here I am doing this thing and they're all going to hate me. And if you follow me, they're all going to hate me. You know, and they're going to hate you too. And so I think even coming into the internet age, thinking about intentionalism and kind of winning or being successful within this era, you have to be comfortable being abject. You have to. Because your whole thing is to appeal to a small group of people and exclude a large group of people. And, you know, that basic process is going to be polarizing. Okay, there's a lot, more, can I, there's a lot more to say, but... Um, can, I, can, I, can I just... I, I, I wanted Raven to have the final word, but just... I don't know, Cattle, Goodell, go ahead. Okay, well, I just wanted to go off of what, what both Bard and, and Raven were saying about the, the victimhood culture. Okay, you got one minute. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I, I just want to say that, it, well, maybe it's not enough time to go into it, to be honest with you. So ju just well, I, Hold on, because I think this is an ecstatic conversation. I think it was a fantastic conversation, yeah. and I want to do it again. So Okay, just to say, time. I just wanted to say it's very rare for a group of men to uh, intentionally take on the category of the abject. Like, like for, and I think, and I think the, the Black Lives Matter is a perfect example of that. If you look at people uh, who founded Black Lives Matter, they're not black men. 
They're black women. Black men aren't taking on the category of abject. Black women are taking on the category of abject. And if you look at and if you look at uh, the the white like the the white men uh, as the category of ab abject, they're being put into the category by a feminine horde. So they're not taking that on on themselves. And I just wanted to say that in your conversations with Bard Sweeney and and Hammerleck, I think the good point was made about that Christianity enabled forgiveness as a mechanism to overcome the victimhood culture. And that that is a necessary stage for subjectivity to learn how to forgive. It's an incredibly difficult thing to do. But the one thing that forgiveness doesn't solve is trust. Because you can forgive the other person, but it doesn't mean you can trust the other person. So I think ultimately, when we go to this tribal mode of thinking that Bard talks about, tribal mapping, to me, the conversation I want to have with Bard and, and anyone else who wants to jump in is the conversation about trust and the mechanisms of trust. Okay, that's a that's that's a good point to stop, and I think I think that's a very very rich topic. And as I say, my whole feeling in this conversation is that it should be continued. Um, and uh, one last thing I want to say. Oh yeah, well, me and Alexander are doing another one with with uh, Tom soon. Um, I wondered if um, our just a second here. If uh, the you know the the founder of Parallax is Tom Amark, and I wonder if if he wanted to just quickly jump in and and tell us about other events that are they're coming up at Parallax before we we thank everybody and 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 end this wonderful conversation. All right, uh, I can do that, um, Andrew. So what's coming up? Um, there is a lecture with uh, Michael Butler, uh, Wednesday, November eighteenth. 8 p.m. Uh, then uh, next day is a, par is a parallax lecture on Gene Gebser and the present time and moment um, from Jeremy Johnson. And November the 24th, John Bunsell will lecture about his simple uh, campaign. That's a new approach to politics and cooperation. And so that's the stuff that's going on in November. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's you can, all, you can all this information. You can find this information on the website on, under. Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, and there's another Sweeney versus Bard with Hammerick, and I don't know. Maybe we could do it in this format if if uh, if people wanted to, because it's kind of fun. Um, so, thank you so much, everybody. Um, I, I uh, thank you very much for the sexual apocalypse for for everything. Uh, it's been uh, just 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 a, a smashing evening for me. So uh, take care, everybody, and. Um, and we're going to we're going to stop streaming now and check out more things at Parallax. Love you to bits, everyone. Love back Thank at you. <laughs>